welcome to the Social Ideas Podcast, brought to you by the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. This series looks through the lens of those striving for a better world. And in honour of International Women's Day, my guest is Dr Lilia Juni, a research associate with the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation and the CEO of Genpol, a think tank consultancy which researches matters of gender. Now, in this episode, she shares how she combines her roles as scholar and activist, talks about her research into digital violence, and she discusses her groundbreaking work on the highly gendered world of organised crime. I began asking Lilia what it is that motivates her to focus her research on gender. Mm, gosh, million dollar question. Well, I can tell you how I started being interested in gender. So. I'm Italian, Southern Italian actually, so I come from an incredibly sexist country. And you know how it is, sometimes when you are enmeshed into something as structural, as deep as sexism, you don't even notice it. So funnily enough, uh, it was when I removed myself from that environment and I moved to the UK and as a PhD student at Cambridge, I started kind of being exposed to feminist activism on campus, that I really started to kind of think in depth of what you know, my being a woman, my gender meant in my personal life and in the lives of people I knew and so on. Uh, so it started as a kind of very personal reflection. Um, it turned uh, into somewhat activism back in Italy, here in Cambridge as well. And then uh, obviously as I was a young researcher, that interest became more and more intellectual. And so it became gradually my topic of research as well. You mentioned back in Italy, yeah. w taking this enlightenment, this, this newfound knowledge, this newfound experience back home. Mm -hmm. How did that go? <laughs> uh, I mean, it needs to be said that, and I'm very pleased to say that, uh, the Italian feminism is now alive and well. I think we're witnessing something very extraordinary all over the world really. There is such a thing as a kind of fourth wave of feminism. There's lots of feminist activists, uh, some of them my age, some of them even younger, were coming together mainly thanks to social media, interacting with kind of older generations of women as well and grappling with issues of gender and, and what they look like in the 21st century. Uh, so you know it's a kind of, of a mixed bag in the sense that uh, this fourth wave is very alive back home in Italy as well uh, and I am involved in the feminist Italian movement. Uh, I sit on the board uh, of an Italian feminist charity and of an Italian kind of nationwide feminist network. However, I would be lying to you if I didn't acknowledge that women in Italy have to deal on a daily basis with deep kind of sexism which is ingrained um, in the workplace, in the institutions they're in and so on. You mentioned the fourth wave of feminism. Can you explain that, please? Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't want to make it kind of too academic here. I suppose, um, so people who are into feminists tend to distinguish uh, um, activism and kind of feminist initiatives and great battles for women's rights into waves. That applies also more generally to social movements. You know how social movements work. There are picks where mobilization is very, very high. And then there tends to be a backlash, or just a kind of decline uh, in the interest towards the cause that the movement defends. That's kind of physiological. And then normally a new wave of mobilization starts. Uh, that also characterized the feminist movement historically. Uh, so by first wave, we normally mean the great battles for women's rights to vote. So the suffragette in the UK and kind of similar battles elsewhere. Then uh, uh, after the Second World War, we had a second wave. Uh, which was focusing mainly on women's rights to work, uh, women's situation within the family and so on. Then between the 70s and 80s in different countries, we had the third wave, which is mainly grappling with issues of sex, sexuality, violence and so on. I'm obviously hugely simplifying it. And I'm sure like lots of feminist academics are raising their eyebrows while I do that, but that's all right. So fourth wave is a kind of more controversial definition. I think uh, people like myself who kind of feel part of that wave are young or youngish feminists. We use uh, social media and new technologies quite heavily to do whatever they do, to stay in touch with each other. And I think another thing that characterizes the, the fourth wave 
is uh, intersectionality. This is something we inherited from the third wave a bit, but we really take seriously the way gender intersects with race, with sexual orientation, with class, with disability and so on. Essentially, we believe that it makes no sense to fight for women's rights if we also do not fight for the rights of other groups and minorities which have been historically discriminated against. So with each wave, is it that there's a different aspect of the challenges and issues that women face that are dealt with? Or is it a ca Because it's fair to, to say, some would say, that it's already all been said before, the battles have already been fought. Yeah, I'm familiar with this argument. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I absolutely don't believe that everything has been said before. But I think, uh, you know, it's a question worth asking. First, as I said, there tends to be kind of uh, uh, backlashes almost every single time, not only women's rights, but civil rights and the rights of every group uh, progress. So every single time some achievements are made, at some point there tends to be uh, a sense, just as you said, uh, everything has already been obtained, everything has already been seen before, and so that tends to be followed by a decline in interest towards that cause and even by a backlash. So I think it's an especially interesting moment to be involved in gender equality and women's rights. Because on the one hand, uh, in some countries, like including the UK or you know, Scandinavian countries, Germany and so on, we have uh, a substantial portion of the civil society which is more progressive than it has ever been on these kind of issues. Uh, so there is an unprecedented attention, most definitely, around women's issues. So just ex think of expressions like the gender pay gap, which have become you know, part of the mainstream conversation, or just think of how after Me Too and Time's Up and so on, the conversation on sexual violence uh, uh, has truly reached a kind of unprecedented extent. However, what we also witness today, and that's extremely worrying, is a backlash against women's sexual and reproductive rights. So think of Trump's America, uh, think of uh, the Polish situation, the Hungarian situation, think of uh, my home country. You know, back in Italy right now, uh, abortion has become again a political and election issue. That definitely wasn't the case uh, 10 or even five years ago. So it's a kind of interesting time where different forces are at play. Society is increasingly more complex. People can communicate around these issues in a way they've never done before. So how then do you balance being a scholar and an activist? So I think I belong to a generation of young academics who see their activism, or they might not even call it activism, they might call it engagement or whatever it is, uh, as really a substantial part of what they do. So once upon a time, you would think of research and outreach whatever outreach meant, as two completely separate things. And I can really see in my generation, if I think of colleagues within the school, within this university, and outside it, how we are all very conscious of uh, the impact that our research has in the outside world, of the impact that we would like our research to have, of the necessity not to lock ourselves into an ivory tower and really kind of uh, be part of broader conversations, broader debates. In, you know, within civil society. Uh, so my kind of first answer to your question would be it's really sort of been scripted, entrenched in, in everything I do. That being said, uh, I'm, I have the absolute privilege of working at the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation, which takes engagement uh, and uh, doing vis-a-vis -vis kind of thinking and researching and teaching very, very seriously. Uh, so since the very beginning, since I, I joined the centre two years ago as a, uh, a teaching associate at the time, I've always absolutely been encouraged by my colleagues, by the centre's director and so on, to, to pursue uh, my more kind of activist interest. So the centre has always supported the think tank I direct, Jim Paul, has always been open to any other initiatives, for example, when it came to um, supporting uh, campaigns against sexual violence on campus and so on. So that's absolutely a huge help. Your current project is researching digital violence against professional women who are highly visible in the public space. That's correct. So I'm really interested, generally speaking, in uh, 
violence against women, any form of violence. When people think of violence against women, gender-based violence, they tend to think physical violence, sexual violence. Some people are already looking at emotional, psychological violence, economic violence, which is kind of a less well understood phenomena and more difficult to demonstrate, to study, to understand, and so on. I am particularly interested in violence that takes place online, which intersects in so many ways with all the forms of abuse which I just described. I'm interested in online violence in general. There are several forms of it. Think uh, uh, cyber harassment, think revenge porn. So revenge porn meaning uh, uh, sharing without the consent, without the permission of the person interested, sexualized images or videos or materials online. Uh, think online grooming and so on. However, in the book, I look at a more specific typology of online violence. So I look at how digital abuse can be used specifically to target, to intimidate, to silence, to marginalize uh, women who are in the public space. So think women politicians, women journalists, uh, women human rights activists and so on. So these women are not only targeted because of their gender, but because they there to be there, to be visible, to make the public space their own. How then do you hope the research will change this? Or how do you think it's going to influence policy to develop an, an, an arena uh, online that is safer for women to use? That's another excellent question. So in, in my research, I do actually look at solutions. I think that's absolutely important when you research a social problem to look at how potentially it could be addressed and solved. And I think that's something that's very crucial to what the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation does. That being said, so if you look at solutions when it comes to, gen to digital gender-based violence, uh, yes, there is the possibility to legislate, but what do you do? Yes, you can talk about you know, criminalizing hate speech and so on, but it's, it's very, very complex, it's very, very difficult. Legislations differ from a country to another and so on. So a possibility, something that would probably work quite well is, as I said earlier on, uh, regulating uh, either internally or obviously with a strong push by the policy makers. Uh, uh, what social media companies do. Moving on from from your research that you've just spoken about, the you know digital violence against professional women, one of the things that I've always been slightly fascinated by is the fact that much of the narrative of feminism, unintentionally, I feel, um, forgets the voices and experiences of women of colour and disabled women. But again, there doesn't seem to be a, a real push to be uh, inclusive, um, to be as open about the experiences women of colour and disabled women have. How do you think that your research, specifically with the digital violence, but maybe in general as well, could, could change that narrative mm -hmm. and give voice to those experiences? So thanks for the question. And first of all, I'd love to say that I completely agree with you. And I'm very aware that I'm addressing your question as a white woman myself. Uh, obviously, I'm not British, I'm not a native English speaker and so on, and I do believe that the beauty of the concept of intersectionality is that it really kind of captures how we all find ourselves at the intersection between kind of different forces and that we all have the potential of being discriminated against. So. Sorry, I was just going to interrupt you and ask you if you could just clarify what intersectionality is. Sure, with pleasure. Just in case you know. Sure, sure. So the idea of intersectionality um, essentially captures the fact uh, that we all, as human beings, live at the intersection, hence the word, between different social forces, different social variables. So uh, I am a woman, I am white, I am Italian, I am uh, uh, fully abled, I am uh, not British, for example. Uh, so the beauty of this concept is that it shows how some of us might be, for example, enjoying some privileges because of our gender, because of our class, because of our education. However, they might still be or be likely to be discriminated against because of some other factors in their background, in their heritage, in their daily experiences. 
Um, so, yeah, as I said, I'm very aware that I'm addressing this question as a white woman. Um, I do believe that I have some insights of it because of uh, the work I do and because of what I just said. At the same time, uh, in an ideal world, there would be a woman of color answering this question. Can't it be that, that because of the research that you're doing, because of the discussions you're having with a wider group of women, that yeah. you, not that you're representing, but that you are able to voice? Sure, but I do, I don't believe on kind of speaking on behalf of. So uh, just to give you a very practical example. Uh, so sometimes when people ask me to speak about specific intersectional issues, I would always recommend a friend or a colleague who is also an expert, but she's a woman of color. Or I would always, so for example, when we organize panels and so on, and we recognize that it's not always perfect, it's not always easy, also Cambridge is a ridiculously white place, for example. Uh, but we always, and I specifically always do my best to have uh, different people who are diverse in terms of backgrounds, thoughts, and so on, to be there. And that this doesn't mean that uh, I don't think we shouldn't be working together or that we can't understand what each other, what, what the other person experiences. Uh, however, I think, you know, for so many centuries, uh, why people, why men especially, have been speaking on behalf of everyone else. So it's the minimum we can do to try to reverse that step by step. Uh, but your question was regarding my research. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it is something I look at uh, and there's no way I could do this kind of research without bearing intersectionality in mind. Because going back to like a very British example, if you look at UK women, specifically UK female politicians were abused online. Diana Abbott, black woman, is the mo not only the most abused woman, but the most abused uh, person in the UK when it comes to digital gender-based violence. The second woman politician uh, was the most abused after her is Luciana Berger. She's a woman, she's white, but she's Jewish. So I think that says it all. And uh, I also look at how uh, women who are not straight, uh, not middle class, uh, uh, so who find themselves at the intersections between different social sources are abused online. And it's quite interesting because uh, in their cases, they really find themselves the victim of kind of overlapping and incredibly vicious kinds of abuse. So. Actually, a very interesting thing to say when it comes to digital abuse in general and uh, the role that gender and race and all these other variables play in it is that, of course, everyone gets abused online. I'm by no means suggesting that men never ever get abused online, especially when we're talking of highly visible figures. However, the kind of abuse men are exposed to is different. It tends not to be sexualized. So people criticize or even bully them because of their politics or policies or viewpoints or what they do. They don't send them rape threats, for example. And going back to women of color, so women who are uh, non-heterosexual and so on, then in that case, the abuse becomes not only misogynistic, but also racist, uh, but also homophobic and so on. You're clearly a very busy woman. Um, and to add to all of that, you're doing other research projects as uh, well. So the other big research project I'm involved in uh, uh, looks at uh, how patriarchy looks like in mafia-dominated communities in southern Italy. Uh, so the study is based on something that I feel very strongly about. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm southern Italian. Um, also, to add a bit of a personal note, my mom is a judge, my sister is a long-term anti-mafia activist. So it's something I really grew up with, was exposed to a lot uh, as a child, as a teenager, and so on. And so even then, well before becoming a researcher and an activist and so on, it was always crystal clear to me uh, that sexes, that patriarchal norms and beliefs and rules and so on were incredibly ingrained in mafia groups, in mafia communities and that they played a very crucial role in the way young men are recruited into these groups. 
So obviously young men would tend to be recruited by mafia groups or to come from very disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, so this is obviously something that should be considered in the picture. However, there is a lot to be said regarding the, the fascination that this kind of incredibly macho-like toxic masculinity model that is exuded, exuded by like mafia men uh, exert on them. So in the project, on the one hand, I look at that. So kind of literally what patriarchy, what sexist norms, what gender inequality looks like in these communities. Uh, so I look at honor killings, for example. It is still horrifyingly uh, quite common for women uh, from mafia families to be killed or to be harshly punished for dating uh, uh, the wrong man, for dating a copper, for dating a guy from a rival gang and so on. At the same time, I also look at kind of feminist and anti-mafia uh, resistance. So in the fieldwork I've done uh, in Italy and in Sicily especially, it was an absolute joy to see how uh, throughout time, actually most of the anti-mafia movement also tends to conversations with feminist activists and so on. I come to absolutely believe in everything I've just been describing. So to absolutely realize that by tackling patriarchy by tackling gender inequality, one could eat the mafia and hit it hard. Not necessarily destroying it, obviously solving the problem altogether, but that this kind of feminist work, this kind of patriarchy dismantling work, I call it in my research, was really crucial to the fight against the mafia. That was Dr. Lilia Juni from the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation and the CEO for the think tank consultancy GenPol. You can find out more about us by searching for Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn.